there you go brilliant okay um so as i say we're going to talk about the acute management of this um covid19 cohort and so this is very much those patients who are either not for the intensive care unit so they're at their ceiling of care or that in a way they're not unwell enough quite yet to be transferred onto an intensive care unit really thinking about bed preservation so what I'm going to cover, let me make sure, yeah, what I'm going to cover is really three main things, thinking about the oxygen therapy, go through some um, awake proning or conscious proning, and then touch on some airway clearance techniques as well. And that's quite a brief bit because I know that that's been talked about in a previous um, presentation. So I think when we first started to hear about COVID, very much the lessons that were learned from Europe and what we were hearing from Europe aren't actually quite as we experienced COVID. Um, we were told that all the patients would either be early tubed or be on CPAP with really high levels of CPAP, kind of like 18, 20 plus, um, and that there would be no phlegm at all. Whereas actually we found things were, were quite different. So hopefully we'll, we can go through that as we, we go through the slides. So just touching on oxygen therapy, because hopefully we could manage a patient purely with oxygen therapy, but I think it's really useful to go back to, um, to our physiology here. So normally when patients are well, so hopefully we're like, like us sat here listening to this, um, our kind of normal quiet breathing um, is around 30 to 40 litres per minute of an inspiratory flow rate, so just quite chilled out. Whereas obviously as soon as we start to exercise in a healthy person or as soon as somebody starts to become unwell and has acute respiratory failure, that inspiratory kind of flow demand really does increase. And so we have to consider that, yes, we need to give somebody oxygen to try and match that. But if the inspiratory demand is so high, normal piped oxygen from the wall probably isn't going to be sufficient. So we have um, access to high flow nasal cannulae or high flow nasal oxygen, which depending on which um, make of device you have, it can deliver between 60 and 130 liters a minute. And so this is really, really positive to help the patients from match that inspiratory demand that they have and that feeling of air hunger, which was very much reported, you know, I can't, I can't get my breath. It's just not enough, I need more oxygen. Whereas actually it was the flow that they probably needed. But I think from a high flow perspective um, in the UK, there was very mixed opinion initially um, with regards to the aerosol generation um, from this device and actually whether it should be used or not. Some centres did use it and used it really successfully, some really positive outcomes. Um, we in Bristol initially didn't use it, um, but actually I think this time round in the second wave, we are going to be getting it out of the cupboard, which is really, really positive. And I think seeing some of those CPAP patients who either just didn't tolerate it, but needed something, um, or we were weaning and just needed that little bit of a, a bridge from CPAP maybe to just normal oxygen, high flow would have a, a really nice um, place and a and really nice role to play uh, right there. And I guess the whole point of um, this kind of treatment is to, if you imagine some scales where you've got a, a fine balance between your load and your capacity, we're really trying to maintain that, to main that homeostatic um, situation. And if it, we do kind of slightly go off balance, that's when we're going to start tipping into our type one respiratory failure. And obviously at all times, we're trying to prevent the patient from being moving from being tired to then being fatigued and slipping into type two respiratory failure. We very much saw this type one respiratory failure, however. So the management of type one, and I, I know that, you know, I don't want to teach people to suck eggs, but again, I really like going back to the physiology to make sure that we have thought about all of the steps of why we're providing such treatment and it doesn't become a protocol. But type one respiratory failure needs one level of support. Um, so we're giving this single level of positive pressure and it's continuous. So it's um, delivered during inspiration and expiration. And it does allow us to, del to deliver a slightly higher um, concentration of oxygen, which is really positive. But the idea is that when you're breathing, especially breathing against this positive pressure, you're splinting open airways and therefore um, creating a greater surface area for gas exchange, hopefully then improving oxygenation, improving um, VQ mismatch, etc. 
The problem we had initially really was that we were delivering CPAP dry. Um, and then, so you therefore also need to be thinking about, yeah, it's great that it's helping from a ventilate, well, from an oxygenation perspective. However, what are the negative impacts of having it delivered dry um, on the mucociliary escalator? So always trying to think, okay, we sorted one thing out, but therefore we've almost potentially created another problem. How are we going to fix that? And whenever I'm talking about um, CPAP, NIV, um, ventilation, etc., I really like using this pressure volume curve, which I'm sure everybody's seen. So you've got pressure along the bottom axis, volume along the side, and with the red line, the bottom one is the breath in, and the top one is that breath out. Um, and it's really showing where your lower, so your LIP, your lower inflection point, and your UIP, your upper inflection point is. So if we just focus on the CPAP, we're delivering that one um, level of pressure. And it, we're making sure that when the patient is breathing out, they're not dropping below that lower inflection point. So you're keeping pressure within the, the chest at all times and preventing that small airway closer with each breath. Because if a patient's having to reopen areas of atelectasis with each breath, that's really, really hard work. Uh, but also that constant atelectasis reopen, reopening is going to cause atelect trauma and almost a, an inflammatory cascade of itself. So we're really trying to help boost that a little bit. We won't go into NIV right now. So from a CPAP perspective, we were um, in Bristol, we created a new um, high care area, um, which actually ended up being on an older person's ward. But the reason that ward was chosen was because it had the most um, individual side rooms. So from an aerosol perspective, it was one of the safest areas to be. So we were creating a respiratory high care, but with a, a group of nurses who weren't necessarily respiratory specialists. They were amazing, but they didn't have that background um, knowledge and that experience of respiratory patients. So we did spend quite a lot of time doing a lot of training, but the, the kind of things that we really were thinking about were the leak, um, you know, making sure they realised that we weren't aiming for zero leak, but also making sure that we did have a really good fit on any interface that we were using, checking interfaces um, and pressure areas. Exactly that's sure exactly when the live way. stream is starting, and you can end up looking like this. When you live stream here on YouTube and you... Sorry. Rachel, was that me or you? I'm going to carry on. Um, so yeah, checking pressure areas. Um, and then, like I mentioned, we were using dry CPAP. So the hydration side of things was really, really important. And very early on, we realized that patients were requiring CPAP for quite a long period of time. Um, and so actually, high, um, nutrition was really, really important as well. So quite early on, we instigated um, early and G feeds to make sure that they had the energy required to, to almost battle this infection, but also they were well hydrated. So then we didn't have that negative impact on the mucosity escalator. And if patients did have phlegm, then at least it was hydrated phlegm and hopefully slightly easier to clear. Um, when it came to breaks, everybody needs breaks, either to have a drink uh, for mouth care, just to give your face a little bit of rest, to communicate, etc. We realised very quickly, again, these, these breaks needed to be really, really short. These patients were obviously de-recruiting exceptionally quickly and therefore desaturating, but also becoming quite breathless and very fatigued again very quickly. So we kept short, kept breaks very short. Um, and whenever people were com coming off CPAP, we then would replace their support with some form of oxygen just so they were getting something during that time. And when it came to weaning, again, the weaning process was super slow. So uh, I think initially we approached it as if we were weaning an acute exacerbation of COPD. But actually, this cohort is really, really different to that. The weans were prolonged. They were slow. Um, we would wean the oxygen before the pressure. And like I say, even during off periods off CPAP, they would still be on quite high levels of oxygen just so it wasn't too much of a, a change too quickly. And when I should have added an extra section there for rehab because you can rehab patients on CPAP. It needs to be very carefully done. Um, but again, we would always be rehabbing on their highest level of support um, just to prevent any negative impact on the patient. 
So moving away from CPAP a little bit, I was going to cover some proning um, stuff. So we use proning quite a lot and you know, proning is nothing new. It's well established, especially for ARDS on intensive care units and those patients who are tubed. But I think over the last few years uh, before COVID, there has been emerging evidence for the use of conscious proning. Um, papers are um, useful, but the previous research is very much using very small sample sizes. Um, patient groups quite unsimilar to um, COVID-19, so there's a few transplant papers. However, the physiology is, is still there. So, it, you know, it's patient lying on their tummy and actually it is compatible with most forms of res respiratory support and you don't need any extra equipment. So it's quite, it's quite, um, well, it's quite handy, really. I don't, can't think of the word I want to use. But yeah, it's really useful to use. So again, going back to the um, physiology a little bit, it's this balance. We're working very much on the VQ, the balance between your ventilation and your perfusion. Um, and this is really important. Ideally, you'd have a VQ of one, but um, we've got to think realistically, we're never going to get a VQ of one because of the variance across all of the young lung units, depending on which lung unit you're looking at in comparison to the heart. So if, for example, if somebody's standing up, the ratio is about 3.3 in the apex of the lung, but about 0.63 in the bases. Um, and that's because your ventilation is exceeding your perfusion at the apex and perfusion is exceeding the ventilation towards the bases. So it's very, very gravity dependent. Um, and as I say, it depends on where your which lung unit you're looking at in comparison to the heart. So kind of on average, we say that the VQ normally, for, especially for us as health is, is, is closer to 0 0.8 rather than a, a perfect, um, perfect one. So here are these illustrations, and I'm very much a picture person, sorry, rather than loads of text. But as you can see in the um, top picture, you've got better perfusion. Um, and so when you've got your source of oxygenation, you're actually trying to oxygenate a poorly ventilated area, which creates quite a shunt. Whereas when you flip somebody over, you get a much more homogeneous distribution and therefore, well, also recruitment of your posterior segments. Um, and so therefore the, reduced, uh, the shunt reduces and you get a much better, more even um, VQ, um, hopefully matching rather than mismatch. So proning is really, really helpful from a physiology perspective, improving the VQ, as I've said, reducing shunt, recruiting those posterior lung segments. And I guess you can say it could help improve secretion clearance just from a, a postural drainage perspective. And these are just examples of positions that we, we used. Um, so here you can see um, one of our techs um, fully lying on the left hand side, fully proned. Um, and then in the middle, kind of more a three quarter prone. And then on the right hand side, in essence, half it's side lying. Um, but very much looking at pillow placement, looking at um, the lower back, looking after that, but also looking at pressure areas. So making sure, thinking of where your mask is as well, make, you know, kind of cheeks, ears, shoulders. So just making sure things are supportive. And again, for example, on that right hand side picture, you could also put a pillow in, in between the knees if that was a, an area of risk or looking at how twisted the, the lower back was. Um, and when we were looking at conscious proning, the outcomes that we used were the ROX index, which is derived from your oxygen saturations, your FiO2 and your respiratory rate. So very easy to calculate. You don't need like blood gases, etc. And then we did use where we could the PF, PF ratios for patients. And this just gave us trends and it gave us an indication of whether the patient was actually tolerating proning. And I guess what was really interesting for us, and yes, we've only analysed a small sample of patients, but the patients still got the benefits and the improvements in their ROX index PF ratios when they were fully prone or even like three quarter and half or side lying prone. Um, which is really important because not everybody likes lying fully on their tummy. I mean, I would absolutely hate it, but, um, and especially for those slightly larger patients of which many co um, COVID-19 patients were a little bit of the wrong shape. Um, these kind of adaptations were, were really, really useful. And again, thinking of the daytime, we still want patients to try and be as independent as possible. So encouraging the patients to get up out of bed in the daytime. So thinking about, OK, well, how can I get those benefits of proning, but in, say, a seated position? And then also, you know, like the pitch on the left hand side, 
um, very much recruiting accessory muscles to help with um, the feeling of breathlessness as well. So definitely considering your adaptations. And we just found the awake proning was really beneficial. We could use it with the CPAP. We didn't encounter any pressure areas at all. We didn't have to use any sedation to help patients tolerate it. Um, we very carefully chose our patients. So we would only do it if they needed minimal assistance of one person. From a safety perspective, if they suddenly became uncomfortable, we wanted them to be able to move themselves out of that. Um, and we didn't have any cardiovascular complications either. So it's, it's really, really positive. So that's just another reference slide, sorry. So just for your info, really, we, we had um, pathways. Like I say, we were on a ward that wasn't normally a respiratory ward. So we felt that kind of communication stuff was going to be really, really important. And here, this pathway is really straightforward, but it, it has safety points in it. So initially, when you're choosing your patients and throughout, really, you know, are there safety points? So are there reasons that you just wouldn't even try it? Simply, have they just eaten? But also, is the patient almost too sick as well for this and actually just needs further escalation medically to potentially be transferred to an ICU? Um, and we hope then, really, that this will help guide the lesser experienced clinicians and just give them trigger points as well and those numbers to be looking for. And as well, education for the patients is really, really important. We were asking them to be doing this for as long as possible throughout a 24 hour period. And, you know, some of them managed up to about 18 hours, which is amazing. But it's really nice that they understand why they're doing this. Um, so we have patient resources to help with that. But as well, when they're not in that prone position, we were considering, OK, well, what could the negative effects musculoskeletal wise be of weight proning and therefore gave them some simple exercises to be doing just range of movement stuff for when they weren't in proning. And that really, again, hopefully helped our longer term outcomes. And then this is just an example of our documentation on the wards, what the nurses would be handing out and then a proning plan for that 24 hour period. And these would just be stuck, laminated and stuck on patient doors. So they were really accessible for everybody to see. And they touch wood, they worked really, really well. So to finish off, it's touching on this airway clearance, which initially we kind of think, thought we wouldn't need because Europe were telling us there was no phlegm. But we did we did find um, secretion. So using very simple techniques, trying to keep the patient as independent as possible and really enforcing, well, reinforcing um, independent uh, management, self-management for the patients. So we, we did use quite a lot of manual techniques. Um, we did use active cycle, very much focusing on that breathing control um, section, especially thinking now what we've learned from our follow up clinics, how much breathing pattern disorders we are seeing um, kind of that irritable cough still there, but it's more habitual rather than having a necessary cause. So really trying to um, stop that from happening, really, and focusing on the breathing control. We did use positions, so postural drainage, to help with any secretions that were present, but usually combining that with um, proning, to be honest. Um, and then mobility and rehab. Mobility is the easiest way to make somebody to take a deep breath, and it's functional. It kind of gives somebody purpose, multiple, multiple benefits. But as I say, that rehab was always really done on the highest level of support that they would need, and that was, that was really, really important. Um, the breathlessness management again, and this is a, a leaflet from one of the UK websites, which are all um, easy, um, free to access. So help yourself. But again, using positions of ease. So it's very much going back to basics, to be honest, with this patient group, all the things that you would learn in you know, year one of um, undergrad um, degrees. But they all worked really, really well. And so I think. The only other thing to think about is those longer term effects. We're very much seeing a, a cohort of patients that are potentially a little bit younger, but they've definitely got impacts on their cognition their memory, as I say, breathing pattern disorders and making sure that when we are discharging these patients that yes, they can breathe and yes, they can walk. But have they also got the rest of the package sorted? Um, you know, they, these patients have been really poorly and when we discharge them, we want them to be able to carry on with their jobs, be part of a functional household. And so all of these things need to be considered. So I think this group of patients, especially, there's no way I'd have been able to manage these as a, a uni profession. We very much have to work very closely with our um, occupational therapists, our speech and language therapists, our dietitians. So it, it was very much a combined effort, but hopefully, fingers crossed, worked quite well. So that's 
that's the end of my slides. I feel I might have rushed that a little bit. I do apologise, but um, I'm very happy to take any questions if people have them. Hi, Emma. Thank you so much for that. I think the, a lot of the um, questions that are coming through are like around um, intensity of physiotherapy and how in obviously we've mentioned quite significantly there's there's a lot of breathlessness and fatigue so have in pace is really important but have you got any tips i think we are definitely still learning but i think something that really i've noticed is that the intensity you have to be quite careful and you need to treat this patient group as an individual group of patients they are not like any other group of patients i've ever met so all of your, you know, all of the little, um, I can't think of the, the little anagram things, but um, normally when we're exercise training, you're thinking about the intensity, et cetera. But for this, you really are bringing it down quite a lot. Like I say, you, we were rehabbing on their highest level of respiratory support, and that was really important. Um, but trying, I think the self-management for me, again, was integral. So going through positions of ease, but actually spending that time with them and then helping them and the occupational therapists build those into a normal routine. Again, that was really, really important. And so actually those group sessions where you're treating as multi-professionals with one patient, that seemed to have the better outcomes. So there is you know, there aren't really, there's not weight training. There's, you know, we, there was minimal exercise bikes on our ward and normally we'd have those plenty and, you know, all in, all in working more, but there was no need for that. It was keeping things very, very simple um, and trying to get the patients as functional as possible. So I hope that's okay. <laughs> no, definitely. Um, I know you mentioned about your awake pronin and um, protocols and things. Things. so there's definitely a couple of asks for shares so we'll work out how we can do that um, and I think one of the questions um, was around like continuing the proning at home in the community continuing at home. well I mean we we spent a lot of time educating the patients of why we were asking them to lie on their tummy and we would, especially when they first proned, we would spend, again, quite a lot of time with them, making sure that they were OK, talking to them about what signs and symptoms they might experience if they almost needed to have a slight change of position. Um, and we would only be doing the awake proning, as I say, if they could then independently move themselves whilst they're in there from a safety perspective. So then I guess when they go home, if they wish to carry it on, if they found it beneficial to them they could and I felt comfortable that they had the the knowledge and the kind of resources to manage that themselves and I think that's okay but I wouldn't I wouldn't want to meet a patient for the first time and say by the way lying on your tummy is brilliant off you go and do it I think it's patients um responded very very differently to the same treatment you think lying on their tummy but actually we had some patients who I had a gentleman in his mid-40s very fit, very active prior to getting COVID and could not manage lying on his tummy at all. His saturations would absolutely plummet. Whereas for him, sitting in the chair forward lean tolerated that really well and actually got the benefits of kind of proning from a physiology perspective. So if we hadn't have spent that time with him working out what was best for him at that time, I don't think then my prescription would have been safe. So spend time with the patients work out what's best for them from an individual prescription give them the education so then they can continue to self-manage and then i'd be happy okay thank you final question um so any hints on achieving best positioning for proning semi-prone for patients wearing a face mask with a reservoir so a non-rebreathing mask yeah, I mean, we had that as well, but just exactly as those pictures illustrate, we use pillows. So if they have the rebreathe, obviously you don't, you don't want it to become compressed. So we'd almost have the pillow. So then it would prop the face up. So then you almost have a, a pocket of space here. Um, and that, that was as complicated as it got. Um, we didn't have any problems with that at all. It's pillow manipulation um, or pillow admin whatever you want to call it but I guess finding pillows is slightly problematic that's probably your first thing mm. to sort out but no no that's it's not difficult um just use pillows 
Okay, thank you so much. Well, that's been super helpful. Um, I'm just checking when we're going to come back from a break. So we've got another short break now and we will be back at 9.30. So just over a 10 minute break and join us back on the live stream. Um, sorry, this is Central Africa time I'm looking at. Um, 11.30. So join us back at 11.30 and um, we'll see you then. And in the UK, that's 9.30. So 10.30 if you're over in Africa. Sorry, 11.30 if you're over in Africa. 9.30 if you're here in the UK.